here this morning. Good morning to you all. And I, if you struggle through the snow or had to dig out your cars like I had, uh, then well done you. So let this, this parable that we've just read and sung about, it, it's an interesting parable, isn't it? You see, throughout the centuries, rabbis, prophets, and teachers, and preachers have all known the power of the story. We remember stories with their sequences, their characters, their plots, and their word pictures far more readily than we assimilate abstract ideas. If you look back to your school days, and if, like you, uh, like, like me, it's a long way back, I'm sure you can still go there, and you rec can recall worthwhile, memorable lessons, or, or even worthwhile, memorable teachers, my guess is that you remember them because they taught you in such a way that your attention was seized and your imagination engaged. Whilst those teachers whose lessons were just dull, in which you felt free, free to play about, were, were just the opposite. Certainly in churches, often the most memorable part, parts of a service are the stories that have been told, or the games played, or the activities undertaken. They're the things that we remember, and have often those things that are, they're often those things that have, have enlightened us most effectively in our search for spiritual understanding. Jesus, following the tradition of the rabbis and the prophets, used stories to teach people about the truths of God. And it's these which we, too, most remember. I said most of the parables teach us a truth about what God is like. But this parable of the unjust judge does just the opposite. It teaches us about what God is not like. As always in his stories, Jesus chose a scenario that was familiar to his listeners. And that's certainly true of this story. In Jesus' day, a dispute between Jews was usually settled before a panel of elders in the synagogue. If the matter could not be resolved in that way, it was taken to a court where, under Jewish law, there were always three judges, one chosen by the plaintiff, one by the defendant, and an independent third judge. In practice, this third judge was appointed by King Herod or one of the Roman governors. These judges were utterly notorious for their corruption. Unless an individual had sufficient money or influence to bribe the judge, there was no chance of getting the case settled. They were said to be willing to pervert the just course of justice for a dish of meat. Indeed, there was a popular pun used on the name given to this, these men. The real name was Dayanya Gezeroth which means judges of punishment. But they were frequently referred to as Danyanya Gezaloth, which means robber judges. So in this parable, it's to such a judge that Jesus is referring. He's not comparing God to such a judge, but rather contrasting him to such a one. Rather, rather like he does in the story of the friend at midnight who's pestered by his neighbour to help find food for an unexpected guest. And after pleading that he's in bed and his rising will wake the whole household, he finally gets up to see to his neighbour's needs in order that everyone can get a bit of peace. If such a judge can be worried, wearied into acceding to a request, how much more? Will a really just and loving God listen to and answer the prayers of his children? Jesus might well have ended the story with the words, How much more will God listen to your requests? Are we then to take this story, meaning that we are to go on praying for the same thing until God finally gives in? Is Jesus saying that if we persist in a particular request, no matter how unreasonable it is, God will answer us? I don't think so. I think that in order to see the parable's meaning, 
we need to see it within the context of all Jesus' teaching on prayer. If we look about the, uh, the, the story, the brief references that Jesus makes about God as a... a, a, a sorry. He take, makes brief reference to parents giving children good gifts. If they ask for an egg, will they give them a scorpion, he says? Of course not. And he's saying that God will give good gifts to his children. If earthly parents know how to give good gifts, how much more does God know how to give us good gifts? Good gifts. There are many times as parents that a child's request, no matter how much craved for, no matter how frequently asked for, however persistently, the pleas have to be refused. Either because the longed-for gift is unsuitable to the age of the child, or it would be unsafe to give the child this thing, or because it's inappropriate, or it's beyond the family's budget, or whatever. And the parents have to say no, and try to explain why the negative answer has been given. Sometimes requests have to be delayed. And so it is with prayer. Sometimes what is asked for, however good it may seem to the individual in prayer, there may still be a negative answer which may be exceedingly hard to accept. It's at such times that we have to reflect that God is of the eternal, and we are so time-limited, we may never understand why our prayer has been answered negatively. There may be a perfectly wonderful reason why a prayer has been refused. Part of the lesson of a growing child is to be able to accept when a parent refuses a request. Part of developing our faith is the ability to accept that sometimes things seem not to be right. Learning the lesson of which Paul spoke of when he said, all things work together for good to those that believe, may not always be easy. And even harder, his acceptance of the will of God, the total acceptance of the will of God. How faithful a people of God we would be if we were able to say alongside Paul, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So this parable is saying to us that we must persist in prayer, but I cannot believe that it's saying we must persist with the same prayer. For that would be so contrary to all we believe about growing in grace and faith and understanding. Indeed, we are being told to persevere. But to persevere and continue on our Christian journey, not continuing to harp on about the same thing, like a child thwarted when he can't have the latest tablet or smartphone or whatever gadget is, is, is the gadget of the moment. I'm a crossword addict. Sometimes odd coincidences occur where re answers seem to be relevant. Last week, apart from le learning that my favorite crossword compiler, Arikaria, is suffering from cancer, one day last week when I was doing the crossword, I was and beginning to think about the, what I needed to say today. One of the, I was really intrigued when one of the answers turned out to be the word persevere. One certainly has to persevere to finish a crossword. During my teaching career, I worked at three single-sex boys' schools, which meant that the staff rooms were overwhelmingly male. And it was in those um, staff rooms that the crossword reigned supreme. Although there was a bridge club as well at lunchtime in two of the schools. At one of those schools, which was a boarding school, we did, as a matter of course, did the telegraph crossword before nine o'clock, the times at lunchtime, the independent at four o'clock, and then most of us went home to the Guardian. <laughs> On one famous occasion, we couldn't crack the independent, and it was after seven o'clock when some of us finally finished the task. We were not for giving up. But at what point 
does perseverance and persistence become more, what is more honestly described as cussedness and being awkwardly stubborn? Let me illustrate this. I've got some papers to give out. It's, honestly, it's not a question. It's not a, a test. But if someone could help me to get these round the congregation as quickly as we can. I was hoping to do this before I have forgot. So, It shows a picture of a, an old woman and a young woman. I'll leave you to fiddle that out. You can take it home <coughs> and persevere with it if you wish. On the other side are, three, are two lines. But really, there are three. But really, there are three. If you hold the paper up, at eye level, and look, you should see a third line emerge. Isn't it extraordinary? I'm sure there's a very good scientific reason for that, but I won't bore you with that. What I'm trying to illustrate, in a way that I hope you'll remember, I seem to have lost the rest of my notes, which is a bit sad, isn't it? Oh, here they are. Who did I give them to? It's your turn. You see three lines. Or you see an old woman or a young one. It depends on your point of view. The parable of the prodigal son also commends perseverance, but this time, the perseverance is that of God, looking out for and still caring for the wayward son who has left and gone his way. God is looking out for us, for you and me. He's willing to listen to our prayers, and he wants us to go on praying, developing, and growing in our prayer life, deepening the reality of our contact with him, and coming closer and closer to him through the spiritual exercise of seeking him in prayer. Not the same prayer, repeated endlessly. Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal for their relentless, repetitive prayers. And Paul had similarly scathing words for those who called endlessly upon the prophet goddess Diana. Jesus gave us a prayer to repeat, the Lord's Prayer, which for us is often a way into personal prayer. But it's also a formula for prayer. By his example, Jesus showed us how integral prayer is to the living life of the Christian. In his life, his constant referral to, to, to God, his constant time spent with God, the number of times in the Gospels we read that he went off to be alone to talk to God. We need to go on caring and loving, and the concerns which we have for people around us may change from day to day according to events, according to how we're seeing things at that moment. For the nature of living is that nothing remains fixed and static. And those things we need to constantly bring to God in prayer. We need to persevere. We need to find fresh expressions of ways in which we can talk to God. That we might indeed grow in grace 
and be his people every day of our lives. If we have spent time with God, that spirituality will grow and we will be more successful in living and being his people. Let's just pray together for a moment. God, our Father, we praise you and thank you for all that you have given to us. Enable us to have the strength and the courage and the purpose to go on being your people, to go on praying, to go on growing in grace, to know and love you better. Amen.